in a minute, I want to show some graphics. I want to do a screen share and show some graphics, and we'll talk through um, the specific discoveries that we made in the art. And so what we found is this really interesting conjunction where icons of what we call religion, religious importance in the past, were not only um, depictions of these figures, and they're weird figures, they're not anatomically correct, and they have all these details that don't really belong there if you were just trying to represent a figure. When you look at these statues in conjunction with the brainstem, when you check them against the biological counterpart, they match up. Through Egypt, Sumeria, and through Asia, and through later in the Renaissance, these certain kinds of statues had fused legs. They all had some sort of interesting shape here that was this um, very um, unique shape. And then some interesting depictions of the head, almost always something there, and then these headdresses. And there's other things. There's endocrine glands. There's uh, um ventricles and the vascular system. But let's start with the brain stem. I'm going to do a screen share and I'm going to put up some artwork and we'll start with your Ram Sphinx just to show this. This is this foundational, amazing thing that Brad um, discovered that has to do with, let's see. Can you see that, Brad? Yeah. That, that painting, that Gerard David painting, um, we use it a lot and I feel like, and we, we d I do cite it in the, in the series, but when we take it out of context, I think the important thing is that that painting was brought to, I found out about it, I think the other uh, people, the medical f people found out about it because it was published in a 2007 uh, Royal Society of Medicine, Journal for the Royal Society of Medicine, uh, 2007. Um, it was a paper by a neuroscientist named Alessandro Paluzzi. He might, I think he was a neurosurgeon. But when we put this image of that painting side by side with that MRI scan, that's from his paper. That's, and so that, this, yeah, that right there, I put that brain on the, um, to its, to its right, the, the picture of the brain, the MRI and the, and the painting is from Dr. Alessandro Paluzzi's paper. So that's, that's, building off of precedent that's using utilizing that paper and then seeing that correlation that he made and his team made and then realizing that it looked like uh, ram's horns so brad took it one step further and he noticed in the same shape the ram sphinx which is pretty cool but it's building on precedent then brad had a much more radical uh, epiphany which goes like this talk us through this brad uh well it was just that um having looking at uh brain anatomy on image internet image searches you just see all these different examples of brain anatomy and i i saw this one in particular and it was the top of this um brainstem model which i think is just a plastic medical model of some sort um it looked like a snout it looked like a, a an animal snout with its nostrils and its nose and um and the more I started seeing it that way in my mind, thinking like, I think this is like an animal, the, the, an animal's snout on top of this column and the, the proportions, talk about ratio, the, this sort of composition, this brainstem made me think, um, I've seen this composition before and it was in these ram sphinxes. Like I, I, like I said, the, the, the ventricles and the thalamus up at the top of that brainstem just look like a ram's nose. And The and slits in the, in the ram's nostrils perfectly yeah. match the slits above the thalamus there, those two slits. And also, here's the fused legs that we were talking about. So first of all, that, tr that kind of uh, the rhomba shape in the middle, that kind of diamond shape that corresponds to the shoulders and the arms, you'll see that over and over again. That's the pons. Below that is the medulla oblongata that corresponds to the fused legs. So this whole uh, lineage of statues that have fused legs, once we start looking at this, it, you start noticing hundreds and hundreds of examples of these things. So at the very top, you have the slits of the nose. Then you have those two ball-like things that are the thalamus. Then um, anyway, so here's before, before you continue, I just want to point this out. You see the two onks that the, the figure is holding? Those correspond exactly to those major, uh, those two big like suspender looking things for the abducens nerves at the division between the pons and the, and the medulla oblongata. And you know, that onk means life. They're probably some life giving. Yeah, I wonder what those are. 
anyway, there's, but every, look at the nemesis, you know, the sides of the Egyptian hat versus this. Look at the, um, you remember all the names of these things. The, uh, the arms of the, of the, it's supposed to be like Ramses the second or something, but I think it's supposed to be whatever ferret is, it's supposed to be him as Osiris. So like, it doesn't really matter. I don't think who the figure is depicted in the Ram Sphinx other than that it's a human form. Um, if it's supposed to be Osiris, that would make more sense because then you, like the same way that you have Jesus Christ in the brainstem's position in David's painting, you would have Osiris here. But even the way that the arms, uh, they talk about this, these the positions of the arms over the wrapped legs, his elbows stick out. And, and like you've noticed this and I've noticed, the elbows stick out the same way that the, the pond sticks out. So you get these pointy kind of side elbows. And I think to me, the thing, they talk about the, the wrapped legs, kind of work selling it for you to me it was always the the infidibulum there was always something where like the infidibulum on the brain was it was the uraeus or like in, in some of the inanna statues there's like she has a castle crown and there's a window there's always something that would represent sort of the, what would be considered the third eye or something like that but it's the infidibulum and um that infidibulum is where the fluids from the hypothalamus and they come, it's, it's where sort of the nervous system interacts with um, 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 the endocrine system. And, and, and that passage of the infidibulum from the hypothalamus down into the pituitary. Um, and then the pituitary they talk about as being the master gland, but really the pituitary gets its, its orders from that hypothalamus and it sends it through that infidibulum. So if you look at the ram sphinx, that uraeus is right where it's it's not as noticeable on this model because you see that infidibulum is just sort of a smaller dot. You see it more noticeably on other images, but that there always seemed to be something where the infidibulum was, which is right in the middle of above the eyes on these human figures. And I think that was that. And even in this brainstem statue, the block above the pharaoh's head in between the the. The, the nose and everything. Even that block to me is kind of a weird shape. Like, why didn't you just put the Pharaoh's head directly underneath the chin of the ram? Why does, it looks like they measured wrong and they're like, oh no, there's an empty block there that we didn't have. But that spacing is there also on the, the brainstem model. So there, this really opened the door for me and made me start seeing things and just looking at brain anatomy in a different way. So here's another one. So here's the brain, side view. Sagittal view, they call that. Frontal view and axial view. So this little bit down here is the brain stem. And if you, you know, even without any adornment, it's a little dude. I mean, it's a, it's a little dude there. So when Brad was talking, and there's the fused legs of the medulla oblongata, hypothalamus and the eyes, look at the weird eyes. So here's the thing. This uh, whole area here is the pons and those two big like suspender looking things are the abducens nerves. So now look at this. There's the pons. Now check this out. The most iconic image from Egypt and the most um, iconic posture. Why do all of Egypt, all the mummies, everyone have their arms crossed? And look at the shape that uh, Osiris makes, how this area corresponds to the pons. So you have your um, fused legs, medulla oblongata. You have the pons and the crossed arms. Then the hypothalamus and uh, these mammillary bodies correspond to the eyes, of course. And then even the uraeus, where the uh, infundibulum, uh, the, that big mass is the pituitary and then the infundibulum corresponds to the uraeus. I mean, that's pretty crazy. That's a number of correspondences. And then the whole thing, and when you um, add the olfactory nerves in, with the entirety of the brainstem, you get this really distinctive hat. That's a very impractical hat. I imagine you're going to have trouble getting into a car with a, with a hat like that. Uh, like there's no aesthetic reason why you would wear a hat like that. But then when you see it in conjunction with these particular bits of um, biology in a number of different applications, you see that strange shape, which is the uh, olfactory nerve and the, I believe that is the um, thalamus. The thing that I talk about in that Science of Consciousness conference presentation is I go over the idea of what if people want to say like these things don't look like these things, even though to me it's, and like to you, they seem very obvious. It's this idea of representational form. I use the example of a snowman, that a snowman is made up of three circles, right? And nobody would say that a person looks like a snowman, but we're right. snowman, and we go that is enough of a close enough representation of a snowman. The bottom circle is the legs, the top middle circle is the torso, and the top circle is the head. 
and you get two eyes, you get two cool eyes, and you put a hat on them. And so when we're looking at the brainstem, people might not necessarily immediately say, how is that a man or a person or a human figure? It's the same as a snowman where you just have a bottom half of legs, you have a middle section, which is the pons or the chest or the torso, and then you have a head and you even have a hat. They almost, you know, um, so, and you have the eyes as well, and the mammillary bodies. So, it, for anybody out there who maybe can't see these things or think it's a stretch to say that that's a person, then you would have to say it's a stretch to think that a snowman is a person because it's wow, not, well not representative of a person. It's not, a, nobody looks like three circles, but we all yeah. go, yes, we get it. Human so, form. one of the things that we hear from people who just don't want this to be true is that we're seeing an example of confirmation bias. We're seeing Jesus in a slice of toast. And so, what I've been trying to put together, and I've been talking to a lot of art professors and, and art, you know, symbolists and sonologists and whatnot, is there a number of correlations? How many correspondences do you need to have before it lifts it out of the uh, possibility that it's confirmation bias? I mean, and in this case, we have hundreds, well, dozens, let's say dozens and dozens of direct morphological and positional correspondences details that don't make sense in real life and are only there because when you check them against the biological counterpart they match up there's no like what a strange aesthetic feature to put these slits in and isn't it interesting that they're in the exact space to indicate the abducens nerve there well, um, even even though too but not only is it is it like how many points besides com of comfort can you get past confirmation bias by just the visual aids of it but then there's the stories of the gods and the, and, the context and, exactly yep mythology where like i know inanna and ishtar are oftentimes associated with um uh, divine lakes or divine bodies of water and so then you're dealing with the cerebrospinal fluid oh and, wow and, and you, you know the idea of a mother even like this idea of a mother who's nurturing and providing um sustenance and and the animals in my opinion the animals on the legs are representative of uh being in control of one's animal nature and how that affects oh. the, hormone, the hormones and that stuff so it's not even just that there's points of visual points where there's like compositional similarities when you get into the mythology of the characters and their symbolism and what they represent and even you talk about this idea of divinity all of this stuff goes back to divinity because if you look at michelangelo's painting god is coming out of the brain like you know there's this notion that all of this that if, if, if all of these figures of divinity are also being represented of brain anatomy it goes into this idea that 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 inside everybody's head inside all of our brains is this ability and, and not to get into any sort of religious thing because that's not what i'm talking about i'm talking about consciousness or this idea of knowing or gnosis is that div our ancestors were using divine images to represent brain anatomy and, 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 you know, and so I think there's something about that, that again, you can get past these, these, these loaded words of divinity or God or any of that stuff and just get into consciousness and states of knowing as a representation of what divinity would be. And even the idea of like old, bearded old men, if you look at like the Greek gods, they're all ripped. They're old men and they're just ripped. They're muscular. And obviously anybody who draws comic books or figure drawing muscular male bodies is more interesting than an old man's old, old body. Right. But right. that notion again is this personification of this is something that's old as time. Poseidon is an old man who's ripped because the sea is old and the principles of the sea are still as strong as they ever were. Wow. So an old man who is virile and ripped is just a personification of something that is still very prevalent that's been around for forever. You know, so the idea that you would be worshiping divinity rather than saying these are personifications of principles, you know, so the idea archetypes. Yeah, so the idea of a divine God that representing as your brainstem is the idea of these ideas of contemplation and thought and, and, and gnosis and that sort of thing. So when you stop thinking about it as, oh, these are their gods and they think they're people in the sky or this stuff, when you go, no, it's just they're representative of principles. The notion that anybody of these people, maybe the commoner, maybe the everyday person, just like today, the everyday person completely misunderstands religion and takes it literally. The artist who made this stuff understood that they're making symbols to personify principles and ideas and not actual deities or beings or that stuff. So. so this thing is really telltale as well. So the pawns, the fused legs, the headdress at the sides, and then again, the infundibulum. Um, oops. Uh, 
has, that has the pituitary that is blocking the infundibulum because like, the pituitary is a gland that's right there and the infundibulum is huh? a small tube that goes there. So you're not seeing the infundibulum, you're seeing the end result, which would be like uh, you know, male anatomy. Brad noticed the trigeminal nerve first. In this case, it's even more telltale because of the weird attitude. I've heard some people say the hands aren't right. But if you take a brainstem out of the body, just like those other um, pictures of the cut brainstem, one is very slit like because it's a dead brain. And the other one is an MRI that's alive and there's actually blood filling up the uh, veins. So if you were to take this brainstem out of a brain, those trigeminal nerves are going to flop and they continue on. The yeah. arms are fantastically telling. And so some people have said, oh, that can't be because the arms aren't right. But I mean, come on, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty solid. And if that weren't good enough, if like their arms aren't too low, and you remember that what angle you look at the brain at will completely determine what angle the arms are at. So if you look at this from the front on, then those attitudes of the arms are about right. But then you look at this one. I mean, that's hard to argue with. You got the two wings that symbolize the left and right hemisphere, and even those t twin sphinxes. And oh, and like you were saying, of the representation of thought or thought, the owls that kind of cropped in this picture here. But uh, on either side of the lion, there's two owls, which are literally the the uh, symbol for wisdom. Well, but so even, here you even standing on the backs of of of, of beasts is like I, emerging, I, emerging from the. Uh, the mirrored beasts. Yeah, I mean, this really tells a story. In the Ephesus statues, when they have they have on the legs, on those fused legs, they're all covered in animals, and there's animals all over them. And if you look at, um, again, if you look at the mythology of a lot of these characters, a lot of these female characters are masters of beasts, and the idea to be to have wow. your, to have your animal nature under control, and 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 how that what that means to the physiology and the blood. It's the story of Noah. All he, all the animals coming onto the ark is represented of someone who's in control, who's a beast master, who's in control of wow. the animals. And so, whenever you see, there's some story of Sybil, and she, she basically turns men into animals, and she's surrounded by like domesticated lions. But she lives in the middle of a dense forest. And I remember even wow. hearing yeah, the dense forest. Forest of synapses. Or yeah, so uh, the cerebrum. You know, um, uh, you have a woman who lives in a in a tree, um, but. Uh, the one on the the, the 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 more cruder carving, like she her feet are all squiggly and weird. That always makes me think like that looks like you know that does. She doesn't have feet. She's got these weird little. But yeah, I, I don't know. It, it just the more I looked at this stuff, the more I could just remember seeing these poses, and that, that's all it was is just compositional shape arrangement. I was like, I see. I'm looking at brain anatomy. I'm like, I've seen this exact composition. Just making it for the surprise, the liquor, the snail, the nose, the zip, 